Um, today we're going to be learning about OER and competency-based education from a wonderful team of experts. And so um, I'd like to first orient you to um, the Blackboard Collaborate window. Um, so on the left, you have access to the audio and video components of this tool. You can then see the list of participants. And you can scroll up and down that list to see who we have online with us today. And then you have the chat area. So um, if you have questions throughout the webinar, please feel free to um, indicate those in the chat. Today we're going to um, start out with some introductions. I am going to provide an overview of the Community College Consortium for OER. And then we're going to um, hear from three experts on competency-based education, delivering improved learning outcomes, the Knowledge to Work project, and OER and competency-based education business degree. And then we will have some time for um, questions. So um, I'm going to be briefly introducing our um, presenters and then asking them to share a few words about themselves. Um, during this time also, please introduce yourselves in the chat window. Uh, we're going to be hearing from Tom Caswell. He is the Director of Learning Engineering at Learning Objects, a company focused on competency-based and personalized learning environments. He has over 15 years of experience in instructional technology and learning sciences. Kiri Johnson is the Digital Librarian for Knowledge to Work, a tax-funded project at Lord Fairfax Community College in Virginia. Prior to joining Lord Fairfax, Kiri was a librarian in Michigan. Mark Jenkins is the Director of eLearning and Open Education at the Washington State Board of Community and Technical Colleges. Prior to joining SBCTC, Mark worked at a community college and a private university in Oregon. I am going to ask um, Tom to say um, a few words introducing himself a little bit further. Okay, thank you. So um, first off, uh, my name is Tom Caswell. I'm, I'm excited to be able to um, share this webinar with you and, and to be co-presenting with Kiri and with Mark. Um, I, um, I'll just say first off that um, uh, oh, I'm sorry. I advanced the slide. Um, is it okay if I? If uh, thank you. Um, so I just wanted to to add that I'm excited to be co-presenting with um, with individuals who work in the community college systems of Virginia and uh, Washington State. I I also worked at the state board for community and technical colleges, um, and uh, just a couple of years ago, and and. Uh, so I'm I'm thrilled to to get to present um, with uh, with this group. Um, one other thing I'll add about my background: I I also um, just two years ago I um, I worked for Western Governors University and was director of instructional design there. Um, and so I'll, I'll as, as much as possible I'll, I'll share perspectives there, lessons learned, and and uh, and just a kind of a, an introduction to competency-based education um, from from my perspective. Thanks. Thank you so much, Tom. Kiri, can you yeah. introduce yourself as a So as Lisa said, um, my background is in libraries. I'm actually relatively new to the CBE and OER realm. Um, my involvement with the Knowledge to Work project um, basically entails helping faculty members find learning materials for um, their program and um, working on the creation of the Knowledge to Work portal, which you'll get to hear more about in my presentation. So I'm very happy to be working on the project and excited to be here with you today talking about it. Excellent. We're really excited to have all of you here as well. Um, Mark, how about you? Can you Hi, good morning, everyone. Along? I'm Mark Jenkins, as you've heard. I'm currently the director of eLearning and Open Education at the State Board. 
Um, I have a, actually a pretty significant background in competency based in adult education all the way back to well, from the mid 90s pretty much. Um, that being said, I, um, I'm functioning today as kind of a spokes model for the team that actually did the work on this program and that would be the amazing staff at Columbia Basin College who have really, really taken the lead in developing this program and driving it um, into the pilot phase in our system and for uh, Connie Broughton, my predecessor who did all the heavy lifting getting this, this uh, through system governance and established in our, in our system. So I have to, yeah, I have to give a shout to those folks and um, hopefully I present their work in a, in a way that they would recognize. Excellent. Thank you so much, Mark. We're very excited to have all three of you here and you'll be hearing from them in just a few moments. My name is Lisa Young. I am the faculty director for the Center for Teaching and Learning here in Scottsdale at Scottsdale Community College. And I'm also the um, vice president of professional development for the Community College Consortium for OER. And um, this is our last webinar of the year, but we'll be having a number of them coming up in the winter and spring as well. So um, of course the Community College Consortium for OER um, is designed to expand access to high quality open materials and to support faculty choice and development in using OER and ultimately improve student success. We consist of over 250 colleges in 21 states and provinces. And um, we definitely um, have a great membership and a lot of wonderful resources available um, to community colleges um, across the nation and, of course, the world, um, including Canada and other areas. So, um, so what we're really here for is to learn about competency-based education and how we um, can leverage OER for that. And so Tom is going to start us out and really kind of provide an overview on competency-based education. So Tom, take it away. Great. Um, so just to double check, can you hear me okay? I'm going to assume that you can hear me because um, if not, let me know. But uh, yeah, I'm, I'm excited to um, have an opportunity to introduce competency-based education as part of this webinar. Um, as, uh, as was said, I currently work at Learning Objects and, uh, and I'm excited about the, um, the, the various tools that are emerging to support competency-based education and, uh, and, uh, and personalized learning in general. Um, so uh, I can skip over this, but uh, basically just wanted uh, to to throw a bunch of logos at you. This is <laughs> these are some of the some of the places that are near and dear to my heart. Um, and as you can see, the state board in the lower left corner is is definitely uh, one of them. So it's exciting to see many of you in the chat uh, introducing yourselves. Lots of familiar names there, and, and I'm excited excited to uh, to have an opportunity to um, to be sharing back with this uh, this group and. Uh, um, so let me just start with a question and, and really just to get to, to kind of kick things off and talk about what competency-based education really is. And I, I really like the definition that uh, Sally Johnstone, uh, VP at uh, Western Governors University uses. She says that competency-based education reorients the educational process toward demonstrated mastery and the application of knowledge and skills in the real world. So I think that that is a, that's a great primer for competency-based education and a, and a good definition. Um, really, I think the focus, uh, when we talk about CBE, it, it's really putting, putting the focus on the, the demonstration of knowledge, skills, and abilities that, um, that that we want to see from our students as they uh, as they um, as they go through our courses, um, and um, 
I wanted to set up a little bit of a comparison. Now, obviously, competency-based education comes in many shapes and sizes, and, and I feel like there is uh, quite a spectrum of, of implementations of CBE. So, um, so I, in general, though, I feel like um, I can set up a bit of a comparison between what I would call traditional higher education and competency-based education. Um, for starters, uh, traditional um, education is, uh, tends to focus um, more on theory and, uh, and sometimes less on application. Um, what I can say is that competency-based education is, is very focused on application and demonstration of, of knowledge and, uh, and, and, and capability. Um, traditional education, where traditional education really um, sometimes has learning objectives and sometimes doesn't, and oftentimes they're not presented to the student, Competency-based education um, uses competency statements and other other statements of of uh, what the student is is aiming at, what they will be capable of, and and puts those right in front uh, front and center so that the students um, understand what they're striving for. So, the competency statements are also mapped to each course activity and, and uh, they can also be mapped um, not only to the activities, the learning activities, but also to the, the, the measurement of those activities, so the, the, the different assessments. And it creates a really, a really interesting um, relationship, which I'm going to touch on in just a minute. Um, finally, traditional, uh, traditional education varies uh, from competency-based in that where traditional education is often norm referenced, where students are being compared to students to arrive at uh, an, uh, an ordered uh, grade, letter grade for each student. Competency-based education um, measures students against a, against a set of competencies. So really, it's criterion referenced. And I think that that's a, a very important distinction. So I wanted to just touch a little bit more on that, on what I call the golden triangle, this relationship between outcomes or, or statements of, of, uh, of capability um, from all these competencies, and, and, uh, and you can have a variety of levels here. So the, the relationship then is between the outcomes and the assessment of those outcomes as well as the outcomes and the instructional content itself. And when you set up this relationship, it really can, can create an opportunity to, to, um, to personalize to the student. Because if you, if you consider an example where a student can, um, can demonstrate some, uh, some level of prior knowledge, um, either through a pre-assessment or a show what you know activity. Um, assuming the technology <clears throat> can support this, um, you're, you can uh, use this relationship, this three-way relationship to accelerate students. Um, when, you, when you can, when you can um, measure their, their achievement and their abilities in <clears throat> for particular outcomes, you can accelerate them through the instructional content. And that's, that's really um, why I think this is a, 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 very, um, a very useful uh, mapping of, the, uh, uh, of the, the three core elements of the course design. And while we're on the subject of mapping, I, just <clears throat> I want to just show just kind of a a brief example of what that mapping might look like. Um, and, and this is really just a, a sample, so it's, uh, it's, it's um, kind of from the top of my head. But um, here you have, uh, as you can see, various levels of, 
of competencies and sub-competencies within a domain, oral health in this case. And then each topic then has its own objectives, which are, which are numbered and which are unique in their, in their numbering so that they can be tracked. Um, with each objective, you can also include um, uh, links or page numbers to specific instructional content or, or uh, readings or videos. Um, and you can also uh, include uh, notes and, uh, and uh, unique identifiers um, to point the designer to, to specific assessments that are going to be used to measure that specific objective. So these are, this is just an example of, of what that could look like. Finally, I'll just touch on um, the fact that a lot of community colleges are now uh, very much involved in competency-based education. And this is just a sampling um, of both uh, four-year and community colleges as well as uh, for-profit and non-profit. You can see that uh, a number of institutions, and, and it's certainly more than just just what I'm representing here on this slide, but a large number of institutions of all shapes and sizes are exploring competency-based education. I would, and I would submit that um, the exciting part about the combination of OER and competency-based education is that when you're working in a, uh, when you have mapped and designed your, your competency-based courses, you can, um, it gives you, OER gives you the ability to improve that content as you, as you're able to see which areas of the course are, where students are performing well and perhaps other areas where they are not performing as well. It's so well organized with a, sort of a backward design process that you really have the ability to to see where the course, is, the course might have some gaps. And I think OER in particular gives you the ability to fill those gaps um, as you, as you uh, continue to improve uh, the, the courses um, term after term. And finally, I just want to touch on a couple of ideas here in terms of student satisfaction. Um, from WGU's uh, NETI, survey results, the National Survey of Student Engagement, um, it, uh, students were rating their entire educational experience 16% higher than the average. And, and NESI, NESI is a, um, a cross-section of uh, a large number, 600 institutions that participate. So that's really a significant, um, uh, that's a significant um, um, that's a significant amount over the average that, uh, that, that students are rating their experience. Um, bearing in mind that this is, for, for WGU at least, this is an online, a fully online experience. Um, secondly, the, when it comes to acquisition of job-related skills, again, students at WGU rate, um, rate their competency-based education 13% higher than than the 600 institution average of, um, of NESI participants. So it's really exciting to see this, this model of education um, not, only, not only being recognized by students as, as, uh, as very um, satisfying, and, uh, um, but also that they, they feel more prepared as they, um, as they prepare to uh, to graduate. And then the other side of the coin is that um, uh, employers are also saying similar things. And this is from a, a survey that's about a year old, um, 300 employers in the Harris Poll, and 99% of them said that WGU graduates met or exceeded expectations. 94% um, uh, uh, rated their their job performance as good, as good or better than, than the job performance of, of other graduates, including um, those in face-to-face in -face, uh, 
universities. So really there's something here that's I think compelling about about the, um, the the focus on abilities and and capabilities that that CBE brings. And finally, 96% um, of uh, of employers said that WGU graduates were prepared for their jobs, um, and and even almost 90% said extremely well prepared. So um, very well or extremely well. So I'll just leave it there. I think uh, my my introduction is is really to say that I think that we've we've come far enough in uh, in the 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 experimenting and testing of these ideas to say that there really is uh, something valuable about competency-based education that should be considered, and uh, and from its from its careful design to to its, to the opportunities to include OER, it's, it's definitely a um, uh, a model that that lends itself well to um, to helping students be successful, and especially as they um, as they enter the workforce. And so I will now switch and turn, uh, turn it over to Kiri. Tom, thank you so much. You provided a great um, overview of how competency-based education really differs from traditional education, um, the impact of competency-based instruction, and the potential role of OER. So, so thank you so much. That really kind of sets the stage for um, what Curie is going to share in the Knowledge to Work program and seeing how OER and competency-based education can work together. And so Curie, can't wait to hear from you. Thank you. So um, I would just like to start by uh, providing some basic information about the Knowledge to Work program. We are a direct assessment competency-based education program. And what the direct assessment part of that means is that our programs are not course-based or tied to credit hours. Um, so that kind of further differentiates our program from other CBE programs. We also use prior learning assessments, which means that uh, we give our students credit for the things that they already know. And I'll talk about that more later. I also wanted to note that we do receive our funding uh, through a tax grant which is a grant through the Department of Labor. And those grants provide funding to community colleges and other higher education institutions for career training programs to help uh, unemployed and underemployed individuals by preparing them for high-skill, high-wage careers. So um, this is the list of the programs that we offer. We have seven programs in three subject areas, uh, health information management, information systems technology, and administrative support technology. All of these programs um, were already being offered by LFCC, but they were translated into uh, the CBE components by uh, K2W faculty members. And they were specifically selected for K2W because of their relation to high skill, high wage industries and regional market needs. All of our programs are accredited by the SAC COC, which is our regional accrediting body. And I just wanted to give you a quick peek at um, what our competencies look like. So this is um, a copy of part of one of the pages out of our course catalog for our associate's degree in health information management. And just to put it basically, it's essentially a list of the skills that someone would need to be successful in a health information management career. So some of the competencies are things like apply retention and destruction policies for health information and analyze clinical data to identify trends that demonstrate quality, safety, and effectiveness of healthcare. All of our um, competency frameworks for our programs are also aligned to national standards. So uh, for this degree, the competencies are aligned to um, the HEMA competency framework, which is the American Health and for Management Association. 
So we've created some student profiles to just give an idea of uh, the type of situations that our students may be in um, and how our program is very helpful in these particular situations. So Stephanie is someone who wants to change careers. She has a lot of relevant experience, but she doesn't have a credential to show employers what she knows. Bob is uh, not very comfortable in traditional classrooms. He prefers online classes, but he needs a lot of support. Zonker has been in school a long time. Uh, he's running out of money at this point, and he kind of needs to wrap up his education as soon as he can into a credential. And Dot owns her own company. She's very self-motivated. She wants to um, learn at her own pace and in her own way. So all of these people already know a lot. They just need to be able to show what they know to employers. They're impatient with the traditional higher education system. They don't um, necessarily want to spend their time and money sitting in 16-week courses when they already may know a lot of the content uh, being discussed. Uh, they're self-motivated. They want to learn at their own pace. So what these students would do um, in our program, essentially it begins by meeting with a career coach, talking about our program. They apply for admission, complete financial aid forms. We're in the final stages right now of receiving Title IV financial aid for our students. And then they create a personalized learning plan with a faculty member. And I'll show you what that looks like on the next slide here. But the educational process for them, um, the way it works is basically they work through the list of competencies, learning at their own pace, using the learning materials that we uh, provide them for each competency. And our learning materials, we use all free and low cost learning materials, OER, wherever we possibly can. Um, and then along the way, they're given lots of support by the faculty members and by our career coaches as well, who provide wraparound support services. And what that means is they basically go above and beyond to help our students be successful in their programs. So they may help them with things like finding transportation or even childcare. So this is an example of what one of our personalized learning plans looks like for a student. Each student is given their own learning plan when they enroll in our program. So um, this student is enrolled in the Certificate in Office Systems uh, Assistant Program. And the first step in the learning plan process is for the student to identify the competencies that they feel they already know how to do. So this is the prior learning assessment part of it. And then what happens is the faculty member um, kind of evaluate um, the student's abilities in those competencies. So they may look at uh, certificates that the student may already have or courses that the student has already taken that the faculty member knows address those competencies. Or the faculty member may themselves give the student an uh, assessment to determine their abilities with those competencies. And then the next stage is for the student and faculty member to uh, work together and kind of come up with a plan for the competencies that the student is going to start working on. So what you're looking at here is uh, the competencies that this student is actually currently working on. And then further down on the page, you'll see the section where um, it lists the competencies that the student thinks they have attained, but they haven't been verified yet by the faculty member. And then the list below that is the list of competencies that have been verified by the faculty member for the student. The last two sections are um, something that we've developed uh, in our learning plan, specifically to meet the requirements of um, our, for accreditation and with the Department of Education. So one of our requirements is that our students and faculty member have a regular and substantive interaction. So we document that in the learning plan um, through the semester milestones and the weekly momentum points. So the milestones are basically goals that the student and faculty member set together um, about where they expect the student to be um, at the beginning, middle, and end of each term. And then the weekly momentum points just document the more frequent interactions. So 
um, discussions that the student and faculty member may be having around the competencies or additional guidance that the faculty member is providing, whatever that communication may be. And then another big part of our program is that we have several um, employer partnerships. We have uh, 10 employer partners right now. Um, we're partnered with three community-based organizations. And then we also have two national partners on competency frameworks. And what these partnerships help us to do is um, ensure that our uh, competencies are aligned with actual workforce needs. So we started serving students with our programs in September, but that's actually only part of the Knowledge to Work project. Um, we're also going to be taking everything that we've done and making it available online for free to adult learners around the world through what we're calling the Knowledge to Work portal. So students will be able to come to this portal. They can review the competency frameworks. They can create their own personalized learning plans. They can use our search engine to find learning materials, including OER, tied to competencies. They uh, can find traditional courses, credential providers, apprenticeships, employment opportunities, all sorts of different resources that um, they may need to help them get the career that they want. So we'll be focusing on the programs that we've developed first um, with an emphasis on uh, health information management resources. But we do hope to expand to include competency frameworks and learning materials for other subject areas as well. So we're really excited about this piece of the project and uh, to be able to promote the use of resources, particularly OER, tied to competencies. And I just wanted to take a minute to um, note a couple of reasons why OER work so well with our uh, CDE program. And the first reason is just that they're free for our students. And one of our main goals is to make um, education affordable for our students. So um, an extension on that is that um, some of our competencies require a more in-depth understanding of concepts and some um, may only require a more cursory understanding, and we end up sending students to all kinds of different resources um, so that we're providing them with the best content possible for uh, each competency for them to learn that competency at the level that they need to understand it. Um, and if we were using traditional resources and using as wide a variety, um, it, it wouldn't help us be as affordable to our students as we are using um, open resources. And another reason um, is that uh, another goal of our project is to provide personalized education to our students. So uh, using OER um, allows us to give students materials in lots of different uh, formats. So we can um, provide materials that will help match up with the learning styles of students so that they can learn in the way that works for them. And then it also allows us to more easily meet accessibility needs of our students. So I've got contact information here for myself. And John Milam, who is the executive director of our project, he wanted to be here today, but he's traveling right now. But any questions or comments that you may have that we don't have time to address at the end of the webinar, please feel free to contact us. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kerry. You provided a lot of great detail on how your program is structured. Um, I love the scenario, getting to know um, what the student characteristics are of um, who's participating in your program, and the fact that everything's going to be available is fantastic, um, as well as the role of OER. So you really provided um, some great information on your program. I know that there are a lot of questions that have come in. We're going to take them at the end, but I am keeping note of them. So thank you so much, Kiri. Um, our next speaker is Mark Jenkins, and he's going to talk to us about how um, OER and competency-based education have been combined for a business transfer degree. So Mark, we're ready for you.
Mark, we can't hear you yet. Sorry about that. Yeah, I really appreciate the. Uh, yeah, I really appreciate oh, the go. level of detail and the nuts and bolts um, work that uh, Carrie and Tom described because what it shows, I think, is that uh, this is actually becoming kind of a, a mature field. I recognize uh, what Tom says and I recognize what Carrie describes in the process documents, everything like that. It also saves me kind of the hard work of describing uh, that level of detail in our program. It'll, um, what I'm going to do today is more or less uh, float up to the system level and talk about some of the opportunities and challenges that we face, we are currently facing in the state of Washington as we try to implement a um, shared system competency-based education uh, degree program. So, the state of Washington, we're 34 highly independent, um, locally managed colleges. We operate as a system, but I think we are um, many pieces more or less loosely joined in some ways, and that that provides um, a lot of benefits to the to the students of the state. When you try to work at the system level, it creates a very interesting environment with lots of interesting challenges. The opportunity of scale is always always right out there, and it's always something we want to um, take advantage of. Uh, the actual mechanics of doing that can be can be difficult. This concept of our uh, CDE program is that every college in our system, all 34 colleges, share a business transfer degree, a similar business transfer degree. There's minor um, numbering differences. There's there's, few, there's business process differences, things like that, but the basic degree is shared by all 34 colleges. The other concept is that we wanted to use OER. We're committed as a system to um, OER, generally speaking, and um, so it was a natural for this program and part of the uh, cost savings package that we hope to uh, create some leverage around in the CBE program. We, it's, we're supported by Lumen Learning. Some of you who know the people at Lumen know that uh, that's more than a vendor-client relationship, that that can be a much more interesting and, and wide-ranging, um, actually, learning community. I think we have a lot of projects with Le Lumen currently going on, some around mastery and competency-based education. And uh, I think we're all um, learning about how to apply OER to CD environments as we go along. Uh, Tom and Kerry described the basics of CDE that are in the following three bullet points, so I'll just, I'll just skip those for the time being. Uh, what caused this to happen in our state was the President's, our President's Council, uh, Innovations Council, got together and they were trying to solve a problem, the way I understand it, that there's a basic demographic shift happening in the next 10 or 15 years and there's students that we are not, our colleges are not or have not yet accessed very effectively. And the idea that came out of that, um, driven by Rich Cummins, the, the president of Columbia Basin College primarily, is that we got to get those, we got to serve those students. And those students are going to be in the 20 to 44 year old range. They're going to have some college, probably not degrees. How do we, how do we create pathways that, that serve those students um, in the coming years? So after much interesting and technical rigmarole in our governance system, what we came up with was to offer this program, the program, any college can, can join the consortium. Currently we have eight colleges in the consortium, they're all listed there, and they're, um, that's actually quite a variety of colleges. Columbia Basin is the lead college. And what that means in our in our system is that all they are hiring the faculty, they're hiring the completion coaches, they are actually teaching the program. And we have some other affordances in our system that, that uh, I'll explain in a second that make that possible. But currently we have eight pilot colleges. We had a very soft launch with just a handful of students at CBC in July and we're moving toward a slightly less soft launch in January, and we're hoping to scale between January and July to um, up to around maybe 250 students by, by July if all goes well. 
So the question of why build as a system, uh, it obviously presents a lot of difficulties, but we do have system assets in our state. We have strong transfer agreements. We have a uh, technological system for sharing courses. Uh, Washington Online, we've been able to share courses since the early 2000s, and it's a natural for this kind of thing. Making that really fly is that we, every college in our system uses the same learning management system. So students are all familiar with uh, with the Canvas LMS. We have common e-learning tools that include Blackboard Collaborate and Panopto uh, for uh, lecture capture. We have, a, in other words, kind of a, a shared suite of tools and sensibilities that, that make this work. And those are listed before. The idea behind our program is that the colleges, the pilot colleges, will share our sharing initial development costs. Every college essentially bought in to the program. CBC and our Columbia Basin and the State Board provided some seed funding. The uh, other pilot colleges are making contribution. We hope as the program goes on that additional colleges in the system, once they see how it works and understand well, whether or not or, and how it can benefit their students, will also buy in. That allows us to uh, centralize hiring and staffing for the pilot program and the consortial uh, model means that students enroll in the college, their local college, and that they belong to that college and that their grades and transcripts come from that college. The teaching and the completion coaching comes from the central location, but the colleges still have a major role in uh, recruitment, advisement, and enrollment. So we had some challenges. These are actually some of the easiest ones, the ones that were actually knocked off. How do we get a staffing model that supports student success in a self-paced program without breaking all our, uh, our faculty contracts? How do we fund development as a system? I think I described how we did that. How do we keep the cost attractive to students? What we're not um, doing this program very far outside our normal business processes. Since there are so many small differences in our business processes across the system anyway, it was very important to keep things like financial aid intact, registration intact, the normal business processes as intact as possible. And so what that means is that we don't have a lot of wiggle room on tuition. We're, the program is structured in six-month terms. Students pay in a six-month term basically the equivalent of two full-time quarters of tuition. A lot of the cost savings, again, comes from our using OER to, so that students never need to buy texts for the, for, the, um, for the program. Updating and validating the curriculum. Well, that's, that's a definitely a work in progress. We're working on, we work on that every day. I think one of our challenges moving forward is how we incorporate all our consortium consortial colleges into that process because they all, all faculty at all the different colleges obviously have very specific questions about the curriculum and how it's serving, you know, their students and will, I can envision that they will want to be involved in those processes moving forward. So basic structure of our program is we need students that have college or work experience and are pretty motivated and disciplined. We have uh, advisors at the home colleges who are uh, communicate with the completion coaches at the at the at the uh, lead college at Columbia Basin to make sure everybody has is sharing information about the students sharing information about their progress and we have uh, a teaching faculty model we that is the faculty are collaborating with Lumen Learning and State Board to um, curate, update, revise uh, the OERs in the program, and so far, so good. Funding and sustainability, as I said, it was a consortium for the startup. That's, we are right now in the process of creating consortium governance structures and things like that. We're holding meetings. We're trying to trying to form a learning community actually across the state so that everybody is sharing information about CBE and everybody feels 
appropriate ownership over the over the program. I think that's one of the real challenges of a program like this is is bringing it into these very different cultures and creating a, a sense of ownership across across the colleges. Again, uh, six month terms, no ceiling on achievement. Students can take as many credits as they can complete in, the, in those terms, and we're using exclusively uh, OER. Now, the OER is kind of an interesting thing. I've talked to a lot of CDE managers across the country, and some of them said, were saying to me that uh, the business processes of CDE can be so daunting that they didn't really want to deal with with content challenges. So a lot of a lot of colleges have gone to um, to publishers who are creating some high quality CBE content and have kind of um, worked with those publishers to get uh, semi custom, semi off the shelf uh, CBE versions. Well, you know that's that's a reasonable way to do it because working with OER, as you all know, can it has it has its own workflows. It has its own um, its own set of challenges, and the challenges and the benefits tend to tend to mirror each other. But it's hard work. It can be hard work to create the kind of alignment and the kind of revision processes we need, and to create the kind of partnerships we need to to keep the OER quality um, moving ahead. What we do have in CBE is the opportunity for evidence-based improvement, and so. We're gathering data about student success using the OER. We're having a lot of eyes on the content. We're continually um, pulling in suggestions into our into our project plan to revise the content, improve the alignment of uh, content and assessments, and uh, just generally improve the quality of the content going forward. It's it's a very rewarding process. Um, it's it's a lot of very interesting work. So the next steps for our program, we are currently creating and refining program level rules and policy based on our pilot experience. We need to create our own system-wide playbook for how CBE is going to, what it's going to mean in our system, what our definitions look like, how, see how course coding goes, how financial aid works. We have to document, disseminate those practices uh, system-wide. Uh, as I said, we're working on continuous improvement of the alignment between OER content and assessment. We're really interested in data modeling right now and developing the right kind of evidentiary model so we can represent student progress and success. And I wrote to system governance, but we're also, we also need to represent that to the colleges, to the advisors, to the faculty, and to the students. So we have a multi-layer educational analytics project on our hands, and we're beginning, I think, to understand what kinds of things are going to be useful in that context. Uh, we're working to recruit and market internally to bring new investor colleges to the table to expand the, the scope of the program system-wide. And we have a strong interest in um, leveraging the again, the system, the idea that we are a learning community in general so that we can share marketing resources and best practices across the system so that nobody feels isolated out there so that we can implement more quickly and ramp up more effectively. Uh, we are also working with groups inside and outside the agency to develop and extend our workforce relationships to make sure that we're offering what um, employers want. And our biggest um, challenge for the next six months, I would say, is um, scale, scale, scale. We really we are trying to figure out how to represent this program to the right population so that they, they um, are persuaded that this is, this is something that, that's going to work for them. And you know, that's a process we're working on, we're working on right now. And I think that's all I've got today. Feel free to contact me with any questions. I know that was pretty high level. I'm happy to talk to anybody at, <laughs> at great length about, about any of this. Thanks a lot. Mark, thank you so much. You provided us. It's, it's been so interesting as we've learned about competency-based education. And then Kiri took us into a, her program. And now we're seeing the system approach and how you're really building on some prior successes of your, of your system in the past. And, you know, working with those learning communities and 
in building this program, I can't wait for a year from now when we bring you back to really look at some of that data and the analytics that you've collected to, to see what your successes are. So thank you so much for um, sharing your project with us. Um, what I'd like to do now is go to some of our questions. Um, we have about 10 minutes for questions. And so I'm going to start. Um, we've had a question from Hara. Um, for Kiri, do the careers have to be listed by the state as in demand? Well, I did answer her in the chat. Um, they don't have to be listed by the state as in demand. Our um, executive director in applying for the grant uh, evaluated what high skill, high wage careers there was high demand for in our area to determine the subject areas that we would focus on. And were those mainly career courses or were general ed courses included as well? For right now, um, the CBE um, programs were are all um, like, like the career focused ones, but um, we do plan to um, expand and have some general education courses that are formatted in the CBE way as well. Excellent. Excellent. Um, you've answered um, a number of questions um, in that. Um, we do have a question from Mark, um, also from Hara. Are faculty hired specifically for CBE, or do faculty get release time to do the CBE classes? So far, we have hired we hired faculty specifically um, for this program, or Columbia Basin actually hired faculty specifically for this program. We have four. Uh, currently, we have four full-time uh, faculty working on this program and six uh, part-time faculty. The, the trigger for hiring in, in this program is going to be we're going the intention or the budget shows, the pro forma shows that we're going to hire a com new completion coach for every 75 students and a new faculty for every 100 students. Um, and that's that's the way the, the budget model was laid out. I think we're going to learn a lot about what scale in CBC or CBE looks like as we move forward, and there might be um, some adjustments one way or the other on that. Thank you. Um, there's another question for you, Mark. Um, what is emerging mastery technology? Well, one thing we discovered when we went about this a uh, couple of years ago, even 18 months ago, was that a lot of the, the technology that we had sort of imagined was going to exist and be able to help us around collecting um, data, providing dashboards for students and advisors and faculty, and collect, yeah, collecting data about student activity, that a lot of that um, a lot of that technology really wasn't quite ready for prime time. So I think the term emerging means that I think that that's I think it's beginning to mature at this point. We're beginning to get good technologies. We're beginning to get good analytics tools. Uh, those tools, one we're using, which is called we're beginning to use. We haven't actually deployed this throughout our program yet, but we're looking at, at one that Lumen is developing called. Uh, Waymaker, which is going to allow faculty to work at the the, the scale and, and different, you know, every student is going to be at a different place in the curriculum at any given moment in this program. So we need tools that deliver information about those students to the faculty in a way that makes their communication with the students more manageable. So. Mastery technology is going to feed information at the, at the most basic level. It's going to feed information about student performance back to the faculty so the faculty and the completion coach can collaborate on um, determining what, if any, interventions are needed to help the student uh, progress. So far, it's, 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 a, it's essentially a communication tool gathering data about the assessments we expect as these tools become more sophisticated that the um, we'll get some pretty significant analytics out of those tools as well. Excellent. 
Um, we do have time for a few more questions. If anyone has any additional questions, please type them in the chat window. Um, Just as people, oh, I'm I'm sorry. Go ahead. Um, there was a question as to why 100 students. I think that's for me, and I don't know that I can how if I can determine how that um, that number was reached. I think that it's pretty typical in adult ed programs to to um, try to achieve um, kind of efficiencies of scale. The faculty role is slightly different in CBE, so we imagine that that uh, the faculty in any given course can handle more students than they might want to or be able to handle in an ordinary classroom, uh, partially due to the, uh, the advising components and the completion coaching components. Uh, but as far as why, how that exact number was uh, reached up, that, that was before I came out of the project. It's pretty typical though. I've seen numbers like that at other institutions doing this. Thanks, Mark. Um, any other questions? Here we go. Um, Esther asked, um, how does college become an investor college? Well, I think right now you can um, you can talk to me and uh, I'll put you in touch with the right people. Okay, and we do have Mark's information here. Um, so you can just contact Mark and, and find out. Yes, this webinar will be archived for future access. It will be available in um, just a couple of days. We did record it, so you will be able to view it. If there are any more lingering questions out there, and yes, the slides and the um, archive are generally available um, shortly after the webinar. So we'll be posting those and sending them out on posting them on the website. Well, I would like to thank Tom, Curie, and Mark for their time and sharing their expertise with us. Um, it was very informative, lots of great information. And um, thank you all for attending our webinar today. Thank you.